I probably don't need to tell you that Pokemon has cornered itself into an oddly specific situation. With its immense popularity and increasing interconnected business ventures, the Pokemon RPGs have become annualized releases. That isn't strange when considering the series of video games that determine all of the new spin-off games, animated series, trading cards and countless amounts of products being licensed and or created by the Pokemon Company. It's a franchise that in recent years has been lamented as one eating itself in the service of keeping this juggernaut of a machine operational. Simply delaying a main Pokemon game is no longer an option, as this would greatly impact all the other ventures attached to the franchise. Therefore, it isn't strange that the ace of Game Freak's sleeve over the last two decades has been to accompany every generation of Pokemon games with at least one remake of an earlier title. Usually, this title is being treated as a new addition in the series that still allows a part of the developers to remain focused on future ones. With both Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl around the corner, I thought it would be a good time to take a look back at these remakes and see how the approach towards creating these games has shifted over the last 17 years. For this video, I'll be only focusing on the official remakes of mainline Pokemon games. That means 2004's Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, the remakes of Pokemon Red and Blue respectively, 2009's Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which were remakes of Pokemon Gold and Silver, 2014's Pokemon Omega Ruby and Pokemon Alpha Sapphire, that covered Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, and finally Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu, released in 2018, that despite using a different core mechanic, can still be considered remakes of Pokemon Red and Blue in their own right. So why go through all the effort of remaking these games in the first place? Yes, the monetary reason is a valid answer and probably affords both Game Freak and the Pokemon Company some room to recoup time and developers for other projects. But I also think that there are two other reasons to remake these games. First of all, they are very good at specifically capturing, pun intended, a new generation of players by releasing these games nearly every five years. As the series has continued to grow and remain culturally relevant, older fans and players have remarked that the older games and Pokemon designs were better. These remakes therefore function as both a key entry point for new fans into what made these older titles stand out, as well as giving the old fans another reason to proclaim their love of these games to a new generation of players. The games are usually about 8 to 10 years removed from their original releases, giving it a huge kick of nostalgia to boot. This allows the games to sell rather easily and generate a lot of free marketing and hype as well. I clearly remember the memes about horns doing the rounds in the years before the Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire remake makes were announced. With Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, we've seen similar sentiments from the generations of players that grew up with the originals on the DS. Simply put, the Pokemon Company has found a way to help the series market themselves due to the sheer power of nostalgia. But as the franchise is always attracting new players, these remakes also function as a way to create a modernized experience. Generally speaking, Pokemon has only reached its current competitive battling format after the fourth generation. This is when most of the abilities, moves, statistics and the split between physical and special moves were finally set in stone. These mechanics are now so synonymous with the modern games that it can be absolutely jarring to return to older titles. Even in Pokemon Gold and Silver, tight balance was difficult. You couldn't fully optimize some Pokemon because they had no moves in its move pool that could take advantage of both its typing and stats. I'm looking at you, Sneasel, having no dark attacking moves aside from feint attack. These changes to the battle system made it far more preferable to return to remakes like Heart Gold and Soul Silver, aside from the visual overhaul and the quality of life improvements. It also gives Game Freak and the Pokemon Company an incentive to shift the competitive scene over to newer games, introduce using different setups and viable Pokemon that may encourage new players to participate. So remakes serve two very different but equally important functions in the eyes of the Pokemon company. On the one hand, these remakes are here to serve old fans their nostalgia by providing the world, characters and Pokemon they remember in a neat package. It's a new coat of paint that still gives them the nostalgia kick they're craving. On the other hand, the remakes serve a completely new audience that is looking for a modern, streamlined Pokemon experience as they are used to with all the mechanics that makes modern Pokemon what it is today. Their prime reason for existing, if we were to follow this line of logic from the point of view of the Pokemon Company, is to keep the brand alive and make both old and new fans re-engage in their products. However, this is a weird split to stand in, since the games cannot be faithful remakes if they are designed to particularly appeal towards a modern audience sensibilities. 
Therefore, Pokemon remakes do not serve the purpose of presenting a faithful remake of the title as it was back then. Rather, it uses elements that are recognizable from the player base collective memories of the original game to cater to a current generation of new players. We'll come back to this later, but overall these remakes are to create a streamlined experience that feels comparative to the modern experience of playing a Pokemon game at the time of their release. It is important to understand that in a certain way, these remakes are not made for the players craving a remake of the games they played at an earlier stage in their life. This is why we can see a sort of growing frustration when looking at the Pokemon remakes in a chronological order from the audiences that were craving for it the most. So let's dig it right into this retrospective with Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. It's baffling that Pokemon Red and Blue received their first remake back in 2004, given that these titles were originally released in Japan in 1996 and a Western release in 1998 and 1999 respectively. But the main argument for these remakes was twofold. Fire Red and Leaf Green had a very particular purpose of adding back in most of the original 151 and Gold and Silver Pokemon back into the third generation of games. Back when they were released, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire only had a full Pokedex of 202 Pokemon that excluded most of the Pokemon that fans had grown up with. No, Pikachu was definitely still available here, but creatures like Lapras, Scyther, Mr. Mime, Alakid and Murkrow couldn't be found in either of these two games. So the remakes served the purpose to help collectors regain most of their collection. This was due to the original Game Boy titles being unable to exchange data with the newer GBA releases. In general, returning to the Kanto region with a red and blue remake felt off for returning players since every mainline game released up until that point had featured this region in some shape or form. This game wasn't made because of a sense of nostalgia for the world and story of Kanto, just its creatures. In hindsight, it feels odd for Game Freak to decide to return to Kanto with these full-on remakes, especially because the decision to add in new third-generation content was safe for exclusively the post-game. The Savvy Islands were small, self-contained segments where a player could catch Pokémon from the newer generation that hadn't made their way to Kanto previously. These islands also emphasize the core accessory of these two games, the GBA wireless adapter. There were several multiplayer minigames that could be played using the wireless adapter on the Savvy Islands and aided players in obtaining berries and other goodies to train their Pokemon with. The story and characters were exactly the same, though in the post game some of the Elite Four got a little more background to give them an additional depth, especially with Lorelei, who now has grown up on Four Island and has her own story there alongside yours. It's not much, but it still throws a bone to older players who did want to know more about the blandest Pokemon region. If we're looking strictly through a faithful lens at these two remakes, I think that Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green provide quite a solid foundation, although their ambitions beyond recognize this ring oddly hollow. It's still a decent Pokemon adventure, especially when holding it right next to the clunkiness of Red and Blue and the many quality of life improvements that the third generation brought with it. But there is very little to gain here for both the nostalgic and the modern player. Unless you wanted a truly complete collection of all Pokemon, Fire Red and Leaf Green were not accommodating to hardcore fans of the series. Returning to Kanto clearly wasn't on top of anybody's wanted list, and it made the games feel rather stale compared to what Ruby, Sapphire, and the upfollowing Emerald were doing. That having this said, I do think that these games were great at roping in a lot of new players. You had these core games that allowed you to play with friends who had already played Ruby and Sapphire, but within the far more linearly designed world of Kanto. The wireless adapter made trading and battling easier than ever, and the new post game added quite a bit of additional content. While I definitely have some personal gripes with Red and Blue and the Kanto region, it's still a good world to introduce players to what this franchise is all about. Its accessibility may have put off the hardcore older player base, but it opened the floodgates for new fans rolling in. And so the cycle of nostalgia would start anew as the fourth generation loomed in the distance. Now, I see people shivering and already wanting to strike at their keyboards with comments about how Heart Gold and Soul Silver are the best games in the series. And you know what? 
I may kind of agree there. While I don't personally top my list because they're built on an already existing foundation and lack a little bit of their own identity if you ask me, they make for some of the best classical Pokemon games in the franchise. Mostly because Heart Gold and Soul Silver are a great blend of the quality of life improvements from the fourth generation, thank you permanent run button and the aforementioned physical and special split, while also being appealing games in their own right. At this point in the franchise, going back to the Game Boy titles was very rough, especially since the DS didn't natively support Game Boy games and you had to go out and find the original hardware to play gold, silver or crystal respectively. And you can sense that Game Freak still held a clear reference for the original games in their own right. Unlike Fire Red and Leaf Green and future remakes, the developers went above and beyond with their love for these installments. Elaborating on Pokemon Yellow's groundbreaking feature of having following Pokemon, expanding the post game immensely and also paying homage to the original games with the Game Boy Player, an unlockable music option that would filter the soundtrack to sound more like the original games battle sounds and all. There's still this sort of odd combination where a remake was sold alongside a new accessory, though I'm certain that no one objected to having the Pokewalker. It's still one of the most unique pieces of Pokemon hardware ever made, and adds a lot to feeling more connected to your Pokemon, which is a large theme of Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I think the reason why Heart Gold and Soul Silver have resonated so well over the last decade is that because they are games that combine both the best aspects for the nostalgic player base and the, at that time, modern players. The pacing and quality of life improvements gave Heart Gold and Soul Silver a lot of tweaks that made the game just that much more fun to play. The sprite design and graphical style feels authentic and visualizes how players must have seen places like Violet and Goldenrod City when they first entered them for the first time around 2000. It carefully walks that line between pleasing older fans and serving newer fans. I really cannot describe it in any other term than reverence for the original games. A sense to preserve these monumental titles in the franchise and treat both them and the players with respect. Yes, there are some clunky implementations still, like how you can only evolve Togetic in the post game after beating all the challenging opponents, gaming experience is slow, causing quite a bit of a level gap, and while the Kanto post game remains impressive, it does feel like it makes Johto less impactful on returning playthroughs, since there just isn't that much to do. But those are honestly nitpicks and can only be felt after playing these games multiple times, as I have done over the years. These are remakes that go beyond their intended goal and have blown the originals out of the water. They've become the definitive way to play these Pokemon adventures. By 2013, players started to see the pattern of the Pokemon remake emerging due to a decline of compatibility between older and newer titles in the series. Where you could still put in your Pokemon Sapphire cartridge in the GBA slot on your Nintendo DS to import creatures onto Pokemon Black 2 and White 2, when Game Freak shifted towards the 3DS, it was clear that they would need to be transferred in some other way or form. The new models and a fully 3D world that was introduced with Pokemon X and Y required Game Freak to reconsider their approach towards remakes of Pokemon games. Naturally, nostalgic players were anxious to return to the Hoenn region after 10 long years. But at this point, the franchise had made a clear shift towards lowering the entry barrier for new players as much as possible. Pokemon X and Y became one of the highest selling games in the franchise, but was clearly not striking a chord with longtime fans as much as before, lacking an expensive post game and challenges that were seemingly moved to online competitions. There was no Battle Frontier or Pokemon World Tournament, and that gave X and Y very little meat to its bones in the long run. So an influx of nostalgic players and capturing on the newly introduced Mega Evolution mechanic gave Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire clear incentive keep the growth coming and consistent under the guise of a remake of the third generation of Pokemon games. Personally, I believe that this is the point where the remake skill tipped too far into focusing on keeping the experience as modern as possible while using a beloved location as a sort of staging decor. It starts in the opening hour of the game that is visually clearly a beloved recreation of the Hone games. Using the original sprite work for Professor Bird's introduction is a nostalgic gut punch that quickly transitions into showing off the 3D models for some of Hone's most unique Pokemon. It feels familiar and welcoming. Hey friends, welcome back. But then, as you start playing, a lot of new mechanics are introduced that seem out of place and early for the progress of the original game. The Dexnav is a new feature that allows you to track Pokemon on new routes very easily. Sneaking is introduced as a mechanic to catch very specific Pokemon stalking the tall grass, giving you an advantage with finding stronger creatures. But I think most clearly demonstrated is the Devon Scientist in Petalburg Woods. 
who you may recall would be ambushed by Team Magma or Aqua Grunt in the original. Here he's still ambushed, but unlike the Great Ball you are given as a reward in the original, which truly felt like a special early game gift, you receive the experience share. It's without a doubt one of the strongest items in all of Pokemon, giving all the members in your party a share of the experience earned in battle. This early on, it means you can very quickly get your entire party up to speed if you use this. Now of course, you can turn off the experience share if you want a more traditional experience, but it gives off the wrong impression. It's like the game is telling you, the game will be hard, so you need to be highly leveled. But instead, the game doesn't accommodate for the usage of the experience share. For many players, this was a step too far. It was a similar complaint that was made by players who play Pokemon X and Y and later on with Sun and Moon that felt that the games were being too welcoming to new players and treated them honestly as if they were newcomers. I think what illustrates the point I'm trying to make best is an anecdote from an acquaintance of mine that I heard a few years ago. Back when he was a teen, he put hundreds of hours into Pokemon Emerald. He went to special events, participated in all sorts of battles in order to finish the Battle Frontier. He was what I would call a diehard Pokemon fan. So you can imagine his excitement over the announcement and the release of Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, reliving that experience but being a better trainer and seeing the world through a new lens. However, before even beating the gym challenge, he quit playing the game altogether. See, one of the struggles in Emerald was to catch one very elusive roaming Pokemon. Latios or Latias could only be encountered as a roaming Pokemon and were very hard to catch because you had to find them and then stalk them randomly across the world map. Back when he did this, there were no dedicated YouTube guides that had this easy to learn tricks that made the process easier. So he hunted his Latios for countless hours in his copy of Emerald. However, when coming across Steven Stone in Omega Ruby or Alpha Sapphire, this madman hands you a Latios without any challenge whatsoever so that you can freely roam across the world map. As a diehard fan, the sheer audacity of making one of the rarest Pokemon in the original games a freebie you'd get not even before finishing the Gym League made him so mad he quit the game and never played them again. I've always found this to be a fascinating story since I think it hammers down what Pokemon remakes have lost over time. The fear of losing new or current players by introducing a specific challenge or obstacle has these remakes lose all their edge. The shift to friendlier NPCs and rivals was already noticeable in Pokemon X and Y, and in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire even the villain teams managed to lose their intimidating presence from the originals. Though I will add that both Team Aqua and Team Magma are pretty much just as incoherent in their motivations as they were in Ruby and Sapphire. The games really tried to make the story feel more impactful, but honestly Pokemon never truly was about the story and at certain points it now feels far more dragged out than it needs to be due to the additional characterizations of NPCs like Shelly, Matt and Courtney. Overall, I think it lessens the ideas and themes that Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire were made for. It's less about people's connection to nature and the world around them, and much more focused on feeling epic and otherworldly, especially when it comes to the new epilogue and post-game called the Delta episode. The conclusion of which sees you riding on a Mega Rayquaza with a spacesuit into the stratosphere to destroy a giant meteorite, revealing the mysterious Deoxys for a final battle. It may just be a tad overkill. Though it is nice to finally have some resolve for the space center in Moss Deep City that was lacking in the original games. These two remakes are a weird bunch, though not necessarily bad games or even bad Pokemon games. But it was the first time where a trend could be felt that the developers didn't carry the same love and attention or had the available time for these two games as they did previously with Heart Gold and Soul Silver. The edges had been sanded off and there is a feeling of a lack of polish. Focus in the post game is put on getting as many legendary Pokemon as possible, which were inaccessible in Pokemon X and Y. There is no longer a fully functioning battle frontier, only another copy of the Battle Mason from the Kalos region that lacks the sheer amount of content and variety that could be found in the original games. The game seems to want to push single players into going online and fighting with their teams against others, but this alienates what gave Hoenn and Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald long legs in the first place. These remakes aren't about looking backwards, they're about moving forwards at a shockingly breakneck pace. The machine keeps on chugging and we don't have to the time to linger on the past and what made the original games stand out from the crowd.
If there's one true renaissance within the Pokemon franchise, it wasn't with Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, it wasn't Diamond and Pearl or Online Plane, and it definitely wasn't one of the 3D console games like Colosseum or XD Gate of Darkness. No, Pokemon Go is truly what made Pokemon the current most successful media franchise of all time. It cannot be overstated what a successful juggernaut Go had turned out to be, and also how much this has impacted the direction the franchise has taken since. It's a beast even after more than five years, and still actively roping in new players and money on an unimaginable scale. It should therefore have been no surprise that there was only one way that Game Freak themselves could capitalize on this craze. What if we were to combine the framework of Pokemon Go with the original hardcore fans of the franchise that were still familiar with the original games but hadn't played many other Pokemon titles since? Therefore, the fourth return to Kanto, yes the fourth, and the first outing of a Pokemon game on Nintendo's shiny new handheld hybrid had only one simple task. Create a nostalgic overload for now parents and older fans alike. At this time, we're talking 2018, it was clear that there were four ways that the Pokemon games were designed to appeal to different player types. For the collectors, that was catching all of the Pokemon, and thanks to Pokemon Bank and later Pokemon Home, the feasibility of achieving a living Pokemon Dex became a realistic goal for many hardcore players. There was of course the group of more competitive battlers, using the game's mechanics to its fullest potential in generating powerful teams that would show off how far this turn-based rock-paper-scissors battle system had come. A new group was slowly growing in size, the Shiny Hunters, spending an obscene amount of time hunting Pokemon with a colored bird defect to show off to other players. Shiny hunting exploded in popularity during the 3DS period thanks to streamers popularizing this playstyle on Twitch. It was something that more and more players could easily perform, and detailed resources on shiny breeding and accessible techniques like chain fishing and the Matsuda method helped it become an intrinsic part of the Pokemon experience. Pokemon Go embodies the fourth and final pillar of the player base, the social aspect of the games. With features like raid battling, team representation and events, Pokemon Go became the most social of all Pokemon games, as well as the most visible to non-players. It brought in an absurd amount of new fans to the Pokemon series and combined pretty much all of the above mentioned aspects. Go made it easier to hunt shiny Pokemon, PvP slowly became its own format in Go, and as the years went on it was easier to complete your Pokedex using Pokemon Go instead of the mainline games. So why would Let's Go make us return to Kanto then? The obvious answer is recognizability. After more than 20 years, Pikachu, Bulbasaur, Charmander, Squirtle, Jigglypuff, Snorlax, Mewtwo and Mew were more than just Pokemon, but rather pop culture icons. Kanto instantly clicked for the first wave of Pokemania fans back at the tail end of the 90s, who now returned after 20 years to this world they loved as a kid. But with the new mechanics introduced by Pokemon Go, these now near 30 year old kids were able to introduce these dated games to children of their own. Or if they didn't have kids, they no longer had to be embarrassed to exclaim their love for Pokemon, since everyone was physically out there playing Pokemon Go in the open. You can see that these remakes are very much catered to this audience. There's no edgy rival that would spit on your face if he could. The region is even more accessible without the need for a dedicated HM user, and following Pokemon even have their own way of traveling alongside side or with the player. Seeing how a remake is caught between once again catering to the nostalgic crowd but has to compromise aspects to also engage the new player base who are this time introduced to the series thanks to Go. I should add that this is not a knock against Let's Go, it just has its own mechanics. Even Game Freak themselves were very clear that Let's Go was not considered to be the future of the series and alluded to the eventual release of a true Pokemon game with Sword and Shield releasing that following year. Let's Go is a perfectly fine game that lingers on the nostalgia that the first wave of Pokemon fans had for the series, but it also accommodates new players with mechanics like visible monsters in the overworld, making the world feel more alive, but also subtracting from the mystery that Red and Blue often had while encountering Pokemon. It's a weird balance when considering where the line is drawn when calling this remake faithful. Yes, it's definitely using the same outline and story beats from the original games, again, and being faithful to what represents Kanto. But it's also not a full-on true remake, and introduces so many new elements that kind of go against the idea of what can be considered a remake. It's easy to point at the motion-controlled Go-like capture system and say that that's the core of the problem, but that's not the issue. By sending off even more what gave Kanto its admittedly limited personality, Game Freak was telling the players that these remakes simply aren't meant for the folks clamoring the loudest for true remakes. 
If anything, let's go prove that the nostalgia for Pokemon may have shifted towards the newcomers back when Heart Gold and Soul Silver were released. That feature of having every Pokemon in the game following you around to interact with is fully realized here. It cannot be a coincidence that nearly 10 years after the Generation 2 remakes, this feature returned more elaborate than ever. Remakes now seem to shift towards the audience that clamors for them and the audience that first played a remake to begin with. This, I believe, is how we finally arrived at the next chapter of the Pokemon remakes, the upcoming Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shiny Pearl. As I've laid out, there has been a shift over the last 10 years in how Game Freak and the Pokemon Company have approached the idea of the remake. In a way, I feel that this has been most responsible for the toxic online culture surrounding Pokemon. It wasn't just the infamous Dexit rhetoric, it wasn't just a tree in Pokemon Sword and Shield, and it wasn't just the lack of rivals in later games. I think that a lot of the criticism can be linked back to how remakes used to present the best of what Pokemon had to offer. A vocal minority, and it is a minority, is clamoring for a time when Pokemon games were good, even though they were young back then, and played a game designed for children. I find it unsurprising that I've seen a lot of myth reactions to what has been shown of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl so far. That is outside of the aforementioned vocal minority, who are pretty much disagreeing with everything the Pokemon company does at this point. It may be because the fans who grew up with the fourth generation of games can still easily access their original games and that since Diamond and Pearl released, the franchise as a whole hasn't shifted drastically that much. It seems that from a first glance, Ilka has opted to stay true to a faithful remake with the more chibi art visual style, a return to the tile system for movement and a more traditional battle mechanic without mega evolutions, dynamaxing or regional variants as far as we know at the time of making this video. However, under the hood, there have also been some weird compromises. The one design choice that made me make this entire video is a design choice that shows how Pokemon remakes have been stuck between being faithful and total bull. One of the best changes that came in the fifth generation of Pokemon was the shift towards unlimited TM uses, meaning you can teach a Pokemon a TM without breaking it. This gave the competitive scene a much needed boost, since you didn't need to grind mini games or battle towers anymore for a specific move to try out on your Pokemon. It's a great change that stuck around for every game since. Apparently for Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, it has been changed back to breakable TMs. The argument was made that it's for a more traditional and faithful recreation of those games, though the developers have said that getting TMs is easier and more consistent than in the originals. It baffles my mind that this is a point where the developers have chosen to remain faithful to a remake for an outdated feature that pretty much everyone, both old and new fans alike, despise. Especially because another change goes in the complete opposite direction. The experience share, that powerful item we talked about in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, once again returns. Only this time, it's not an optional feature, but always turned on for your party. The experience share was always optional in the original games, and a powerful item, but never forced upon you. To suddenly return this as a forced feature into the remakes goes against the entire idea of them being faithful remakes, but rather catering once again to players new to these titles. See how it's becoming a sort of flip-flop of inconsistent game design? Yes, the developers absolutely have the freedom to implement these changes. I'm not demanding they undo this. Some are necessary since it can be very rough to return to the original Diamond and Pearl. I don't need to tell the original players that the Elite Four and the final champion were insane difficulty spikes that could have used far more ways to help you level up near the end. But by making design choices like breakable TMs to remain faithful, but contradicting that philosophy at the same time by forcing the usage of the experience share, it seems that Pokemon remakes are now caught between the two fires they they once aimed to serve. I want to clarify, I am not saying that these remakes are going to be terrible because of this design decision. I have not played either Brilliant Diamond or Shining Pearl. And also, let's be real here, we're talking about video games. It's not the end of the world when the wheels of capitalism keep spinning and that causes changes, making us face the fact that we're growing older and that things aren't made for us anymore. Pokemon games have always been intended for children as the primary audience. And over the last 25 years, most of us have simply gotten better at understanding video games compared to when we first played a Pokemon game. The Pokemon remake puts into perspective why the series has been so inconsistent when it comes to serving nostalgia to the longtime fans and how the Pokemon company has evolved 
pun intended, beyond the need for meeting fans' demands. With every passing decade, a remake looms on the horizon, and I can see why it can hurt original fans to see a new interpretation of the media they grew up loving. But it's also okay to admit that change is part of the process of growing up, and that a thing simply is not made for you anymore. As I've stated at the beginning of this video, the Pokemon remakes do not serve the purpose of presenting a necessarily faithful remake of a particular game as it was back then. Rather, it uses elements that are recognizable from the player base's collective memories of the original title to cater to the current generation of new players. I cannot wait to return to the world of Sinnoh and see another interpretation of this world and its characters. Experimenting with new Pokemon and setups I wasn't able to think of 10 years ago. If I truly want a faithful version of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, there's always the originals to go back to. As we've seen by looking back at what Game Freak has done before, it's clear that this sentiment has been at the core of what goes into making a Pokemon remake. It's not about a lack of features or a change in existing systems. A perfect remake cannot exist. Because my 14 year old self doesn't exist anymore. And maybe just maybe, that's okay. Hey there, thank you for checking out the entire video. It was a lot of work to put together, but I'm very happy to get all my personal thoughts out on the Pokemon remakes in this thing. Special thank you to the team over at Nintendo World Report for helping out with checking the script. I'd also like to thank Joel and Brett for helping out with factual checking and editorial checking, as well as Leon for helping with capturing some of the footage you've seen in this video. So very grateful to those people. I'm also very grateful for all the incredible music I have been using for this entire video. You can find each one of the songs down in the description below with the artist who made it, so be sure to go check them out because every single one of those remakes this is amazing. Like, you should check them out. They're great. You know what's also great? Videos, am I right? You can check out more of Nintendo World Report over on our YouTube channel. We also do a lot of tech analysis and video reviews, including the video review of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl done by Jordan, which was very good and addressed some of the points that were made in this video as well, which we didn't collaborate on. But, you know, it's good to have someone else out there who also saw these things while having actually played Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. So be sure to check out that video review somewhere here. And if you really like what we do at Nintendo World Report, you can support us on Patreon. We use the money to make more awesome content for you guys. So if you really like it, go check it out in the description below. You can throw money at it and that's all cool. And last but not least, don't forget to like and share this video. You can also tweet at me or you can subscribe to the YouTube channel for more cool content. I'm gonna go and play Burning Diamond and Shining Pearl tomorrow, to which I'm still very excited for. So I hope that you will enjoy a Pokemon release day in your own right, and I wish you the best of times. Smile you later!